Would you please take your Bible, and I, I want you to turn to the book of Acts this morning. The book of Acts is the companion volume to Luke's Gospel. And I want to read the opening section of the book. Uh, this is uh, Luke's history of the early church. So Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 1 and following. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, quote, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but I will, uh, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, Two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let's ask the Lord to help us as we look at his word. Father, today... Uh, we're so grateful to just be able to be in your presence and to be a gathered community of believers to worship together. Part of that expression is to sit under the preaching of your word, to be fed, to have our minds uh, uh, challenged and our faith increased. And we just ask that you'd give us uh, a mind that is alert to the things of God, quick to receive faith that is increasingly strong. And so as we consider, Lord, your return today, I pray that you would uh, help us and build our faith and encourage our hearts and help us see very clearly that, that this promise is faithful and true. So we commit our time around your word into your hands, anoint, uh, be glorified in it in your name. Amen. I wanted to read through this passage in order to set the trajectory of our thinking this morning. We spent two Sundays, if you recall, talking about and thinking about the Olivet Discourse that's recorded in Luke chapter 21. And the position I've taken is that this predictive prophecy that we find in the Olivet Discourse and that's recorded for us in all of the Synoptic Gospels that this particular discourse is a prophecy that's related to the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Jewish temple. And that occurred in 70 AD. Now, when that position is taken, when we take a look at Luke 21, um, Matthew 24, which is probably the most popular and well-known rendering of the discourse, and we... Um, frame it in this particular um, uh, context and framework in terms of it relating to something that was going to occur 
uh, not too long from when the prophecy was given, 70 AD, about 40 years. When we take that particular position, then um, a companion question is raised. And it's an important question, one that we should all uh, think about, and that is, is there biblical support for the conviction that Christ will return at the end of human history? So if this large piece of material, prophetic, prophetic literature that we read is related to 70 AD, fulfilled already at that particular point in time, and doesn't relate to the second coming or the return of Jesus at the end of history, then do we have biblical support to have that hope, to hold on to this as something we expect, we anticipate, we're, we're looking forward to. In fact, it's, it's the basis of our hope. What can we do in terms of providing some solid biblical material that speaks to this question? It's an important question because the second coming of Christ is our ultimate hope as Christians. And it also uh, determines our understanding of the nature of human history and it shapes uh, our understanding of human experience. We need to understand that we live in an increasingly secularized culture, and I think probably all of us are aware of this, that the gospel, that the Christian message, Christian convictions, Christian understandings seem to be very alien and foreign to many people. It's a, it's, a, it's a shock, actually, to know that there are people that we rub shoulders with every day that have absolutely no understanding of the gospel, don't have the most fundamental sort of pedestrian understanding of what the Bible says, what the Bible is all about, what Christians stand for. But this is the condition of the culture today. This secularization has happened um, in an intensified way over the last decade or two and continues to become the dominant sort of move and movement and trajectory of the culture. And so it's a secularized culture, Christian understandings, Christian convictions are often rejected or at least they're, they're marginalized. This has uh, created a spiritual uh, a metaphysical vacuum. And vacuums of this kind are always filled because we find it almost impossible to live with an understanding of mortality that provides us with no hope. We need to understand that bare, um, bare naturalism is absolutely hopeless. This idea that uh, when you're dead, you're dead. That, that the, the whole of life experience is 70 years, perhaps a few more. And then it's over. Now, you know, I, I think it's easier to buy into that idea when you're young. But I found that my attitude toward death is changing the older I get. And uh, that particular position will not do because it seems uh, that life is so short, it's so uh, passing. Uh, we want to hold on to something that this isn't the extent of it, this isn't the whole of it, that there's something beyond this. Life extends beyond death. Well, in a secularized culture, there is absolutely no answer to this question. If, if it's simply naturalism, materialistic world, that all we are is just a uh, mix of molecules and atoms and flesh and bone, and once it's gone, it's gone. If that's the case, then there is absolutely no hope. Life is futile. Life becomes absurd. Well, many people have turned to Eastern ideas 
since they've already rejected Christianity, they said, we've been there, we've already, uh, we've already done that, uh, we've, we've, uh, we've uh, been raised in, quote, a Christian culture. Um, I, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to return there. I, I, maybe there's some other source. And the East has become quite attractive. I, I certainly remember when it was at its peak, when it was much more apparent and, and in your face, if you remember... Um, back in the early 70s with the hippie movement and Haight-Ashbury in its hey heyday. And, and I was living in San Francisco and I was working in Haight-Ashbury. And uh, all of this um, convergence and this mix of, of Eastern ideas and gurus coming, and uh, that was the dominant direction. That's where we're going to look to find some kind of ultimate answer to life and uh, to, to discover true spirituality. And that has had a dramatic um, impact on our thinking. All of the old hippies who may have now discarded the idea. But it still is quite prominent in our culture. Looking to the East... How does it understand human existence? Well, these Eastern ideas are, are radically, um, they're profoundly different than biblical understandings. They tend to be pantheistic and cyclical. They see human existence as being determined by a persistent cycle, a cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth until one is uh, sufficiently perfected and finally, finally released from the cycle into nirvana, a state of oneness with all things and a condition of indistinction, disembodied and absorbed into the universal one. Personally, I don't find that very attractive, but, uh, and I don't think I understand it. But there are many who hold to that view now, turn their back on the light of the gospel, the glorious biblical message, a message that honors the physical world, that, that doesn't present the idea that salvation is somehow an escape from the body, but rather a salvation that transforms and glorifies the body. I turned back on it. Well, the biblical understanding is radically different. It presents human history and experience as linear in nature, not cyclical. It begins with creation and ends with the return of Christ and recreation. And all human events occur along this line of history, which is headed toward a preset end, the second coming of Jesus, the general resurrection of the dead, the completion of Christ's redemptive work in the saints, and the execution of final judgment on the wicked. History's headed somewhere. History is purposeful. There's a flow to it. It's filled with intention. As modern Christians, then, we, we, need to, we need to make sure that we have a substantial, solid, firm foundation for our conviction that Christ is going to return at the end of this line of history. So when we look at the New Testament revelation, and are confronted with passages that speak of Christ's coming. The question we have to ask is, which are related to the 70 AD event, and which ones speak of Christ's second coming at the end of history? I want to spend some time this morning uh, establishing this distinction. When it comes to those passages that refer to the 70 AD event, 
What distinguishes them are the time references they contain. And these are true time references that carry um, a sense of immediacy, something that's going to occur soon. And if we respect the plain meaning of the words used and understand them to be true references to time, uh, to a span of time, to the unfolding of time, a, a, a sequential uh, reference, not, not a reference to suddenness. And there are a lot of, a lot of Christians who have decided that when, when the word soon appears, that doesn't mean soon in terms of time. It means sudden. And I think that's a twisting of the language. We need to respect the words that are used. So if we do this, then uh, there's a large body of prophetic statements that must have reference to 70 AD. I, I want to read just a few examples to you. Some I touched on a couple weeks ago. This one, uh, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. This is found in Matthew 10, uh, verse 23, if you want to read the context of it. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. There's a time reference here. He's saying to his disciples, and he's, now he's not speaking to us. 2,000 years removed. He's speaking, you means the disciples, okay? He says, you're going to go preach, and you're going to be persecuted, and you're going to be driven from one town to the other, and the gospel is going to be spreading. But I want you to know, you won't finish the task before I come. Well, if Jesus didn't come in some way before that task was done, then we've got a false prophet on our hands. Matthew 16, verses 27, 28, something similar. Jesus, again, speaking to the disciples. For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay, there's retribution here, he will repay every man for what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Then we have the Revelation, which um, is very different than the uh, Gospels, the Synoptics, in terms of their presentation of the Olivet prophecy. But it is probably... In large part, it's probably John's rendering of the 70 AD event. He peels back, um, he peels back sort of the, the veil so that we can, see the, we can see the spiritual activity behind the historical scenes. And he approaches these, um, these visions approach the same events from different vantage points. It's a powerful thing. The language is extremely foreign to us but very familiar to the first century reader. Apocalyptic language, Old Testament references. The images there uh, are drawn out of the Old Testament. They understood. And, and this revelation, um, this, this book, certainly encouraged a persecuted church. And listen to how it opens. We dare not just read over this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants what must soon take place. What does that phrase mean? What must soon take place? And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. If you were to go to the last chapter of the Revelation, chapter 22, um, the soonness 
of, of Christ's coming is emphasized. Verse 7, behold, I am coming soon. So the, 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 the revelation begins with that and then ends with the same a restatement. Behold, I am coming soon. Verse 10, do not, in this very important line, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Don't seal this up. Don't put it away. And this is, uh, this is unlike what's, um, what Daniel is told. If you remember in Daniel's prophecy, he is told to shut up the words and seal the book. Because what he saw would unfold over an extended period of time. John is told, don't seal it. And then he ends by saying, surely I am coming soon. You see, all of these are best understood as referring to 70 AD and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. But along with these passages, there's another category of coming references. And these are not strictly time-defined. And uh, let's look at three of them. Uh, I want to look at three now, and then we'll, we'll look at some of the more prominent ones in a moment. Acts chapter 3 the church has really burst onto the scene. Uh, they're just beginning to preach in Jerusalem, and uh, there's been quite a response on the day of Pentecost. Peter is now preaching in the uh, temple. You remember the lame man has been healed, and there's quite a bit of excitement about what's going on. And so there's a crowd that's gathered, and Peter is, is preaching to them. And uh, um, he says this, beginning uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent. Therefore, and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send, notice, He may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for establishing all that God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. So Jesus has been received into to heaven, but he is uh, going to be sent again. He's going to return. And um, the, the second, there's no time reference here. The second coming is inferred here. Then uh, Hebrews 9, which uh, Pastor Bill read this morning, a section out of it, Chapter 9, verse 25. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest entered the holy place yearly with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age, at the end of the Jewish age the Old Testament age, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Save those to, to consummate, finish the redemptive work that he started that's going to come to its full expression at his second coming. It's interesting, this, just those few verses are just packed with profound truths. One of the statements that stands out to me is that it's appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment should die once, not, not often. And you come into the presence of God for judgment. Um, there are people who are waiting for Christ's return. They truly believe. That's what we're challenged to do, is that our faith would be 
strengthened and we would be forward-looking in our vision and believing that Christ could come. He could return at any time. In Titus, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. For the grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all men, training us to renounce irreligion and worldly passions and to live soberly, upright, and godly lives in this world, awaiting, awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a manner in which we're called to live, and this expectation of Christ's return inspires this kind of distinct life of godliness, of striving to please Christ. And he says that this is our glorious hope, our great hope that we have. And notice that he says that it's the return, the appearing, the parousia of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. Jesus is God the Son. So what we find in the New Testament are references to a coming of Christ that's subject to a definite window of time for its fulfillment. There's that category of coming references, as well as other coming statements that aren't time-conditioned. But they speak of a future, second coming of Christ. And this coming has very distinct features and associations. So what are the defining features of Christ's future coming? His coming at the end of history. Let me just cite a few. First, he'll come physically and visibly. He'll come physically. It's a visible return. Um, this is what's underscored in the Acts passage that we initially read this morning. Uh, remember this line? Remember the, the angel said to the disciples, quote, this Jesus, the same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. You saw him go physically. He was lifted up, disappeared into the clouds, received into the heavenlies. There's, there's profound mystery here. But it was a, a physical uh, lifting, ascension. And he says, the angel says, listen, the same Jesus, not a different Jesus, the same Jesus is going to return. And you're going to see him return because he's going to return in the same way as you saw him go. You see, Jesus is still embodied. He's forever the God-man. So when he returns at the end of the age, he'll appear physically and visibly Unlike his coming in 70 A.D., invisibly executing judgment on Jerusalem through the armies of Rome, he was very present, administering judgment, but not visibly seen. But like many of the comings in the Old Testament, you have God coming to judge, not, not in a physical way, but using uh, another, another nation, the armies of that nation, to judge his people. But it was a real coming. But this coming that we anticipate is physical. It's literal, visible. Also, Christ's second coming is associated with resurrection and glorification and final judgment. In 1 Corinthians 15, 
Paul. He establishes the connection of resurrection with the second coming. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 and through 23. Um, I'll read it. You can look it up later. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as an Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. See the connections that are made. Um, there is a resurrection. We can believe that we are going to be raised as believers because we're in Christ. Um, we're, going to, we're going to experience a real resurrection. Um, Christ has been raised. You see, therefore, we can hold tightly to this conviction that we also will be raised. And this resurrection is going to occur at His coming at His second coming. And it's going to um, catch away and involve all who belong to Him, all that are in Christ, who've trusted Christ for their salvation. The, the question, this is probably uh, the pastoral question that needs to be asked, the personal question as well. Do you belong to Christ? You only have hope if you belong to Christ, if you're His, if you've come to Him in faith, you've repented, you've, you've surrendered your life to Him and determined to follow Him. And God has done this gracious work in you. So it's associated with resurrection. It's also um, connected to glorification. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, 21 but our commonwealth is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body by the power which enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. We're waiting. Our, our, our citizenship is in heaven, and He says we're going to be taken to heaven someday. And um, there's going to come a moment um, when Christ returns that um, our bodies are going to be changed, glorified, just as Christ's body is glorious and glorified. So the second coming of Christ is related to resurrection and glorification. And then... It's also related to the general resurrection of the dead and, and judgment. Jesus um, said this. This is John chapter 5, verse 28 and following. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So there's a general resurrection at His coming of all the dead. And those whose lives have been marked by, characterized by evil, they're not in Christ, it's judgment. Those who have been marked by good, and we'd say God's goodness and God's gracious gift of righteousness and a life that reflects that, reality, it's, uh, they're raised to life. Now there's a third, third feature of Christ's second coming, and that is that human history will come to an end. And the cosmos, the universe, will be renewed. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 again, and then 24. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. 
That's the end. Then comes the end to human history. When he, Christ, delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. In the context of this event, this event in divine history, Christ will deliver the kingdom to God the Father. This, this present chapter in the story of redemption will come to a close and Christ will have completed the redemptive work he was commissioned to do. We rejoice in this. A new day. And all things will become new. The entire created order will be liberated from the consequences of the fall and it will be renewed. I want you to listen to, um, to the strong, very, very confident language of Paul. This is Romans 8, verse 18 and following. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. It's certainly a great line of text, isn't it? And it, it speaks, I'm sure, to many of you that are struggling right now. These present sufferings, and, and they're real, and we're going to have them. These present, the present trials and difficulties. He says they're not worth, we can't even compare them to the glory, to the, the weightiness, the uh, substantial nature of life as it's going to be, that will be unveiled, be revealed to us, where the mystery goes away and we see with clear eyes what God has in mind, had in mind for us all along since the foundation of the world before it. Um, then he goes on, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, when they're going to be exposed in all of their glory. That's certainly at the coming of Christ, um, their second coming. For the creation was subje subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The whole cosmos, the whole created order of things will be liberated from the consequences of human sin and renewed. I think for me, I think perhaps you would relate to this. Uh, this is far beyond my understanding. that the cosmos, the universe that we live in is dulled and dying because of human sin. That, that, that is a huge idea to ponder. It says something about the gravity of man's sin. I have no idea. I don't think any of us in this room have a full, complete understanding of how horrific sin is. It has changed everything. But when Christ comes and gathers his elect, his own, and this comes to a close, it's all renewed. Death is no more. Everything becomes brighter, clearer, more substantial, more solid. It's hard to imagine, but that's our hope. If you're in Christ, if you belong to him, this is your future. I want to close. I want to close by reading two passages that describe the second coming of Christ in, in quite dramatic terms. 
First one comes out of First Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those that have died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not proceed, will not hinder those who who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so... We will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We'll always be with the Lord. That's, that's heaven. Perhaps some in this room, some in this room, may not taste death, but be here when Christ returns. You will be caught up. You will be transformed along with the dead who are raised. Amazing moment. Something similar, uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians, and this is the one, the classic passage, Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians, verse 51 and following. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. show you a mystery. I'm, I'm, I'm going to reveal, sort of give you a little glimpse, a little hint. And that is we're not all going to die. But some of us will be caught up and changed. Raised to glory. The second coming of Jesus changes everything. So the New Testament gives us a clear and and compelling witness to the second coming of Christ. We have good reason to believe that Christ will return. This is our blessed hope, and it should help um, shape shape the way we live. It should help us um, face the future with great confidence. Oh, that God would make this real to us that we wouldn't become so bound up, so earthbound, so caught up in present things that we forget completely that this is passing, what is permanent is coming, that Christ is going to return and he'll make all things new so that we can live with this, this, um, this understanding, this hope, this whole vision. This is what it means to be Christian. We believe that Jesus is going to return. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, today, 
what glorious truths these are. They're unimaginable. They're very difficult for us uh, to really grasp. There are times when we find them hard to believe. Present. Our earthly existence looms so large, preoccupies our minds, our attention, our, our thoughts in such a prominent way very difficult to stop for a moment and, and uh, think that what we're experiencing now is passing. What is yet to come is permanent. That what is corrupted is going to be completely liberated and uh, will be glorified. Lord, you alone can help us, help us believe. You're the only one that can enliven these promises, your word, to our hearts so that we become a people who are hopeful and living in the shadow of your coming in a very conscious way. Speak to us all. Draw us close. Those who have not yet come to faith, give them faith, Lord, we pray. Bring them to a place of trusting Jesus. For those of us who have come to Christ, we continue to trust. May we be encouraged to hold tightly to Jesus. He's our hope. So we commit now your word into your hands. May it produce good fruit and build our faith, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.